Thanks, everybody. Um, so I think um, we did this a little bit in uh, the chat, but unless Dan and Melissa, you had sort of thoughts about the flow of the discussion, um, I think what we could do is go back and um, for the libraries, the libraries and or consortia that are currently issuing student cards for K through 12 and or academic, any anytime you have that kind of bulk loading, um, if people could just sort of talk about what their what what they make available to their member libraries or what they do with their libraries. So here at Pales, um, we have um, we have a couple of uh, schools where or library systems where they work with the school districts. And in some cases, it's um, an opt-in. And so in that case, most of the times the school, the libraries use more like a Google form. So they're capturing the information directly from the families as opposed to through the school. And then they're either uh, hand us, if they want to do physical cards and then hand the cards out, then they're hand doing those registrations. Um, we also offer an option, which is that we have a spreadsheet template that our libraries can fill out. And so they can, um, you know, use an Excel formula to assign card numbers. They, we make sure that the prefix is going to be okay. And then they use this sort of pre-designed spreadsheet where um, it's pre-formatting the data for the way that we want it in Evergreen. So for instance, for like ID type, then they have to put in the numerical code that refers to uh, the selection from that menu. So they're giving us then that, um, pre-formatted spreadsheet and then uh, Equinox, our hosting provider, uh, loads those in batch for us. So we will do that um, in any play in any any time when we have a library sending us a um, spreadsheet of students, whether it's data that's coming directly from a school district or it's data that they're collecting themselves. Um, that's what we do. One of the things that we've been talking about recently is right now they're emailing us those files, which we don't like super love. Um, and so we were talking about, um, you know, would it make sense for us to set up an SFTP service so that they can um, upload it? And then um, that's not something that we go back through and scrub them um, so that they're not sitting around, but it's we don't have really an ideal protocol for that. We are in the process, as I know some of you already have done or are in the process of um, adding Kipu as an eCard registration project. And so we are hoping that that will um, also improve our options for bulk loading of cards. So that is what we are doing here. And I will uh, type some of that out into the um, notes document. I put two things um, into that document. Uh, first, it is an existing launch pad ticket that is related to this that has to do with batch loading existing accounts um, to user buckets. And this is something we come up against in the MFA project, shouldn't shorthand that yet, multi-factor authentication project um, and how to administer that. But I could see it definitely be in here. But one thing that is not in launch pad yet, although I I know that there have been conversations. I can't, I don't know, like the ones I haven't been involved in, but um, a way to utilize the pending patrons uh, functionality that's already in there to add to it the ability to bulk create rather than one at a time. Um, so if there is a time later on maybe to discuss whether that, um, is of interest uh, because that being that we have, there are third party services, obviously, like Kipu and, and some others. I think uh, Patron Point also has um, something in there. But it also seems that it, there's value in having a native application within or native functionality within Evergreen itself for managing this as something that touts itself as being um, library type agnostic, but more so useful for all library types, um, whether they be school consortia with schools in them, 
academics, whatever. Okay, Chushing. And um, I see uh, Taryn probably from Pines and somebody, possibly Gina from Bibliomation are <laughs> actively typing. Um, Martha, do you wanna talk a little bit about what you guys are doing at Noble? Sure. Uh, we have six academics and one K through 12 library who all send us files. Um, depending on the institution, we either get a daily file or a weekly file or a file at the beginning of a semester or an annual file. They're mostly CSV files. One very small academic sends a spreadsheet of their new students every year. Um, <clears throat> we load them into a staging table um, and then with a script, either uh, update the on-file records or create a brand new record if it's not already on file, matching on student ID. So we have to have that student ID. Uh, it has to be unique and institutions can have numbers that may match. So we have them add their three letter location code at the end of any ID number to ensure that they're unique. Um, it's it's worked very well, but it's it's a, I wish I could automate my side. Um, libraries, um, SFTP the file to us. We used to get them via email, but <clears throat> that's not really a good way to do that. Um, but they do FTP them to us and either, either they send me a ma an, an email saying that they sent me a file or in the case of the daily ones, I just, I just know they're there um, and then I'll go in and load them. Do your accounts, do they actually have student names on them or anything like, or are they yep. solely student IDs? Okay. No, we get, we get name, we get local address, sometimes home address if it's somewhere else. Okay. ID number. Yeah. And even for the, uh, for the, for the high school, uh, we, we do get names and addresses. Those are all local addresses. They, they're all, um, it's a boarding school, um, mostly on campus addresses. They go next. I can go next. Um, so um, we've been doing this for, I think, since 2020 was our first year, I believe, um, which was, of course, a weird year in many ways. Um, so we started out um, just in a pilot program with one system, but now we're used at, um, oh, about 20, 25 school districts, I think. Um, there's a map on the page that I'm putting into chat right now at the bottom of the page. Um, so each school district has a MOU that they have to assign with the library system in their area. So the agreement is between them, not directly with us. Um, we set up a S SFTP site for each school district um, and they can upload files as often as they want. We ask them to do a single large, like complete upload in the fall um, around when school starts, when they have all their new student data. And then they can do nightly or weekly or monthly, whatever, um, however frequent they want to do change uploads. Um, we automatically expire these accounts on October 15 every year. And so if the new upload um, in the following year doesn't find them, then they'll stay expired. And if it does find them, then it'll just update any relevant information. Um, we also do use, we are opt out. Um, we talked to some other libraries that were doing it um, as an opt-in basis and they were getting such low response that we made the executive decision to only allow opt-out <laughs> and the school has to handle it on their end uh, so we're not dealing with all these little individual opt-outs all over the state and uh, we also do use kipu for self-registration so people in areas where the school districts don't want to do this or um, uh, anybody else that's not eligible for some reason can still uh, log in and access e-resources right away that way. See, um, 
And yes, great, uh, excellent notes. And of of course, um, <laughs> Taryn, Taryn has a the I don't know if it's you that maintains the page on on the Pines Wiki, but uh, lots of details in there and uh, very helpful in terms of a bunch of the considerations to think about. I feel like somebody it's, could just easily lift this and and customize it. <laughs> that's that's what we did. <laughs> Susan Morrison is in charge of this project. Um, I was involved a lot in the planning and at the beginning, um, but she she is in charge of it now. Um, but she's at a doctor appointment right now, so she can't be here. But I put her contact info on the page. Uh, Josh, let's go to you next, since you admitted to um, borrowing <laughs> from Vines. Yeah, we just uh, copied from Pines and made whatever little changes, and it works really, really smoothly. Yeah, the, the most challenging part is just getting school districts to respond and setting up new stuff. And um, yeah, I need to work on that this week. For yeah. Those new ones that are going to start in August. I, I don't know if anybody has thoughts about this, and I, mine are all sort of gathered from. Um, you know, second and third hand interactions. Um, but what works, what has, what I have seen work is, is the, is the cliche of it's not what you know, it's who you know. So if, if you don't come to the superintendent directly, but if you go through um, the school librarians, or if you have like a friend of a friend who's a school board member, <laughs> or somebody on the library board who has been a school board member um, to to do the um, sort of net networking and and come at it from from that way. Um, I've, we, I've we've, out, and, you've, and you've probably done all of those things. Well, <laughs> no, we just we haven't had problems getting the superintendents on board. Um, it's just that they assign it to somebody and then that person never responds. Yeah. So we've had that same experience. Um, some of the people that they assign it to have never even heard of the project because they were just kind of dumped it and then they have objections to it too. It's like, well, we're uh -huh. not getting involved in the middle of that. So, but before we get involved or at the time we get involved, um, Susan always insists on a meeting that is involving the key stakeholders. So their tech person and, as well as somebody and their leadership and hopefully people from the um, instructional staff too, because it's not going to work if the teachers aren't involved and the librarians aren't involved. Um, if I can jump in there for a second, um, that is definitely something that we've wrestled with. So we started doing library card drives, really focusing on them in 2021, I believe. Um, and we found for our um, public school district, which is um, five elementary schools, a middle school and high school, we have had to be very, very persistent and very um, willing to try every level of approach. So we've gone through the school principal, we've gone through the library instructional staff, we've reached out to individual classroom teachers. Um, so I think absolutely right that whoever you know, whatever contacts you have and partnerships you can build, um, definitely use that and try all these different avenues because um, whether or not the superintendent is on board, if that teacher isn't willing to hand out applications or isn't willing to get that information for you, it's not going to happen. So um, that would be my number one advice is just be persistent, use those contacts and work with the people in your community who are willing to, to help you out. Thank you, Maureen. That's definitely, um, I, I think that that like that that stakeholder engagement piece, right, um, is is really important as as you and Taryn and Josh all noted. And it, I I tend to think, oh well, if you've got the administration, then you're fine, and that's not that's not the end of it. <laughs> We have learned that IT staff can really intimidate the superintendents. Yeah, right. And you, you know, you want your IT staff to be privacy conscious and security yeah. conscious. And um, this, this would be something where uh, if, if, you know, someone had, ex they're, especially if, if they're not, you know, like reading the details, 
um, it would be easy to come up with with objections. Um, and I think that at least in Pennsylvania, we're very much in a climate where people are kind of looking for reasons to say no, uh, not everywhere and not all the time, um, but it's it's less risky to say no. So that's often a, a bar that has to be overcome. Yeah, I did a, a library migration with a school district once and it was, uh, I'll keep my thoughts to myself because we're being recorded. Okay. <laughs> Um, who have we not heard from yet? CW Mars? Did we talk to? Let's see. Who has who has notes in here that we haven't talked to? Uh, Bibliomation folks. We just uh, need one minute and we can contribute. <laughs> Gina's going to come back and help us. Oh, okay. And, and while we're waiting, I will say that I just added that second launch pad ticket that was listed in the notes mm -hmm. um, to the roadmap for 3.14, which is add a support script for importing patrons. Um, it is pull requested, so that might be able to get that into the next release. Um, I'm ready now if you want the fox to start, start talking. Uh, yeah, fox. <laughs> I realize like how distracting this is. I'm sorry, everybody. It's delightful. Uh, yeah, it's something different. Um, I don't really have anything that I, I think is like out of the grain of like what's been discussed so far. Um, but it is interesting as I'm in this role, I became the systems manager from being a special uh, system specialist for about like five years. Um, so I always did like the very technical aspects of it. Um, the SFTP sounds really good because we um do require at least like now for them to email things in um and otherwise it's just pretty much like me working with a script to make some staging tables just to populate uh information that they'll send us and then from there just like massage the data out and put it into other tables um i was thinking about maybe making like an automated system for this but typically like I, the issue that i've been finding especially with this last year's load is a lot of the um, librarians didn't have things formatted correctly. So th that became an issue. So the error handling um, was much better to work as like the script going from line by line. Um, so that being said, we uh, I definitely learned a lot from that experience because uh, data was loading like kind of weird. Um, things are becoming like inactive, like it, uh, accounts were becoming inactive when they shouldn't have been. Uh, but once we figured out like what the issue was, um, I think we have to try to do a better job of like coordinating with them, of, like what data we actually need. But yeah, we just uh, try to anonymize by having the address be the school address. We go by graduation year uh, instead of like a birth date. And um, whenever we do anything, and if you're someone who's like technically involved with the database, um, we do like the staging part of it and massaging the data out. We like to include statuses, like if it is a new student, to put that um, in the uh, outputs of certain queries that we're running. And then anyone who is like continuing on in a different grade to be updates, um, you know, just for our statistics and purposes of making sure their accounts are the same going through. Um, yeah, I don't think that there's really much anything else, but uh, yeah, SFTP sounds really good. And if there's any other ways that people anonymize data, uh, just be interested to know. So if you use your school address, Gina, like do does the school get the late notices then for the kids or yeah, they they rather handle giving the notices out to the students anyways. Yeah. So like for billing example, um, they just rather have it so they could just give it to the homeroom teacher, which is also included in um one of the fields. I think it used to be guardian before one of our uh, updates, and I can't remember where we keep that homeroom information, but yeah, they'll have that there. Um, it actually might be just in the mailing address part, just the homeroom teacher's name. Um, like so, sorry, I address. haven't looked at it in a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the address too would be a good place for that. The, the, the yeah, it could be that. Also. It could be that, yeah. Tara and I, because you've been doing, you guys have been doing this for a little while. And I'm, I'm so you, if the student doesn't update by October 15th, they expire. 
Yeah. And so, how long do they stay? Do you keep them then forever or how long no, do they stay? Okay. We um, purge them after a year. So okay. that so gives then them that time next like October yeah. 15th. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, so just in case the school was late in updating it or something like that, it'll, they'll still be in there. And also we have a lot of students that move from one district to another. And Georgia is a fairly transient state. Um, in a lot of areas. So we don't, um, like if they move from one play card area to another, we just let them get registered with a new card at the new district. So their old one might still be active and we just let that slide. Um, Makes sense. Um, I don't know if, if I can ask a question. Um, I, I put this in chat as well. Uh, you're, you guys are talking about the different data pieces that you're importing. What I'd, I'd like to know, what are you importing? Um, because the there was instant objections and and FERPA concerns when when we started talking about the idea that an opt out model would be more eff effective than an opt in model. And so I'm just curious, what like I said, we were we were trying to think of bringing in the most bare bones potential record that we possibly could have to try and avoid that. But I'm hearing some pretty detailed information that it sounds like you guys are. Um, importing. So I'd just be curious to know what that is and how you're dealing with privacy concerns. I'm, I will say that FERPA specifically, if I'm remembering from my higher ed days, has to do with, with not, not with directory information. Now the student right. ID. Yes. It's, yeah. it's directory information is allowed. Okay. I think. I'm not, a, and I'm not an expert on this, but my very And I think good... they do have to provide and opt out for people who don't want their directory information to be shared, but they right. they typically already have that infrastructure. Right. Mm -hmm. So then is all the information you're pulling in considered to be directory information? So this the student ID I don't know I don't know how that works. I I was in higher ed when some schools were still trying to figure out how not to use social security numbers as student IDs. So uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And in Georgia, uh, we don't, they have a, a, a school, a student ID that's assigned by the state, which we don't use because um, that's considered private, but they also have a student, like a lunch card number or a lunch, um, like a, just a lunch card number that they use that the students know by heart because they just go and, you know, tell them what their number is when they go to lunch, I guess. Um, it's also different from when I was in school. <laughs> um, but we, uh, in most cases, we use that number. And we actually leave it, we do leave it up to the school um, district to decide what number. So they could assign a new number if they wanted to that had no relationship to any other number. But we need to have some sort of number because we use that as the key um, to so know which student is which. Like so, so, and, and just to be clear, is everybody using student IDs or is anybody, I, I thought somebody was talking about actually assigning a unique, a new unique barcode. So that's what we, we often do rather than trying to figure out. The nice thing about using the student ID is that then, especially for places where you like, like the play card, they can do physical checkouts. So then they can bring right. their student ID right. to the library and use that. What we would typically do is have the library because t often the student IDs are shorter and we don't allow schools to use short barcodes. So we are assigning them an ID. And then because we have the welcome email set, so as long as if it's for like younger elementary kids, then there can getting it back to them can be hard, but we do it mostly with later, like mid grade through high school. And so they're providing us with that list of email addresses. So they're just getting the email that says, this is your card number. And so then, then in our case, if they want to do physical checkouts, they have to come into the library and then uh, they can just trade that in for a physical card. Like they'll go ahead and add a new barcode that's the physical card. Okay. So then we're not we're not dealing then with any of that student ID information either. And it is just the directory. So the then so student ID numbers, I've heard address information and homeroom information, names, all of that stuff. You guys haven't had any concerns with. FERPA or any other privacy concerns that have, have prevented you from collecting that information is what I'm hearing. We uh, have had some schools that have not been willing to move forward with it because of that. But and for the most part, our 
um, privacy concerns are written into state law. I mean, like we are <laughs> required as part of state law to to uh, f maintain certain patron confidentiality rules. Um, so, you know, even if we weren't concerned with that in the beginning, it, it, legally we have to take care of their information. Um, and most of the schools are are fine with that. Like once they understand that we are secured, we're also, you know, um, under the auspices of the Georgia Board of Regents. Um, so they're but like the Georgia University Systems IT department is managing our firewalls and everything like that. So it's pretty, pretty bomb proof. I don't want to jinx anything by saying that, but. <laughs> Do you segregate uh, your, your student cards? Do you make them invisible to anybody that can access the the client we don't have any restrictions throughout the state like because we're like one library card for the state mm -hmm. so you know if we have to allow that student to go anywhere you know on vacation if they're going to see their grandma or right. whatever they can go use the library anywhere so all of those um, libraries that are not associated with a school district, do they all, are, it, is it part of like a statewide, well, a Pines wide confidentiality agreement that says that there is student information in there and it is, I don't know. I mean, we obviously treat, we treat it with the exact same privacy that as we any do other any account. other. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that passes the litmus test for privacy in, in Georgia. Yeah, cool. That's what our, that's what the state lawyers said. <laughs> I dig it. And I think that a, a lot of school districts, if, if you can get them to engage about it, as, as opposed to it's something where, you know, it's kind of a, a roadblock that most of these things can't, you know, specific concerns can always be addressed through an MOU. They don't want to share the student ID. We got eight different ways to handle that. They, um, you know, they want to make sure that there's safeguards around how long the data will be re retained. Um, you know, that can, that can be addressed. So as, lo as long as they're like in, in it to ultimately get there, those there's, there's a way around it, um, but it, it can be really difficult, both logistically and emotionally when it feels like the, the partnership is not there. Well, we're and, lucky we have one of the larger schools is eager for this, for this and, and we feel like if we could get them on board, that they would, I think there would be others that would follow suit. And so I think that's, if we can get your foot in the door with somebody, I think it really helps. And so we're really hopeful that we can um, move something forward. Absolutely. We still have a, a very friendly, you know, partnership. Taryn, how many library school partnerships, how many were in your pilot schools? There was only actually one school district. I'm not sure, like 20 schools or something in the initial one. It was a large school district um, in the pilot and that lasted for Three years. Oh, no, I think it lasted for about a year. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Maybe six months even. It, I think it, it I think it was supposed to last for a year, but it moved faster because of COVID and they wanted kids to have more access while they were at home. Right. Okay. Cool. So it sounds like all of you or most of you um kind of contact the school so that they'll load their records with CW Mars the the school lets us know they want to do that so um that seems to be different so Joan are those schools who are members of CW Mars or yeah. schools who have relationships with members they're members okay so okay. what what some of you are doing um you're loading school records but they're not part of your consortium is that what's happening here so this the students are residents of the service areas of okay. libraries in the consortium but the school libraries themselves are not consortium members if there are school libraries i get it okay yeah we've, we we've had other places but in pennsylvania the number of school libraries is it's very scary Right, right. 
Yeah, we've had one request to do that, but we haven't um, taken that up yet. There's just so many details, I guess. You've all lived through it, but there's so much to figure out. Well, and for anybody who is using um, uh, a e-card registration product like Kipu, um, you know, you can can do what they've done in Georgia, which is if the school district isn't into it, you can distribute that sign in link and they get, you know, it's not a, it's it's depending on the state. It's, a you know, maybe a slightly different uh, level of permission group. But um, we do have lots of places where that's how they do the opt in is to just provide a sign up link. Um, and then that data is collected either b like by the library and then loaded or it's going directly in um and i do think um you know one of the things that would be really interesting and we'll be doing this as part of our kipu pilot is to look at the the data on you know the number of transactions i know that um we, we met with um a librarian in Allegheny County, which is um, not a member of our consortium, but it's it's the Pittsburgh metro area. And they have a relationship with their school district. They have an MOU and it's gone swimmingly and they just, the school district loves the stats and the library loves the stats. So um, if, any, if um, anybody is looking for things like that to kind of leverage <laughs> those discussions. It might be worth a listserv email because um, I'm sure there is a lot, a lot of like the anecdotal evidence that we're hearing here, but I think people could also come up with some numbers as well. Um, Cause I think these programs are often really successful. Some discussion in the chat about the welcome emails. Yeah, can we bring this into a voice chat for a second? Sorry, I was yeah. trying to follow yeah, yeah. along in the comments. I'm getting lost here. So the initial question I think was Ava. Is there asked, like the action triggers, right? For those uh emotions? Yeah. Okay. Is uh, uh yeah, I was, uh, uh, I asked because uh, when we import uh, the new students, uh, we have a problem that uh, the account has been already created. And uh, then I, I believe it's who, uh, it's uh, account created. It doesn't work because account has been already created. So we uh, uh, we thought what to do, how to, uh, how to, Take the welcome email. Uh, then we uh, then we uh, choose the uh, barcode um, change. So it because we uh, usually use as a temporary barcode the student ID, and then when they um, have the cards, we record the card uh, chip uh, chip number and. Uh, this work for us, but it means that uh, every time when some uh, patient changes the um, uh, change the card number, uh, he got the email. So it's uh, how we do this. Maybe there is better way. I, I hope you understand what I mean. If you if you if you do it better, I would like to hear about it. Um. And I think uh, Taryn is going to give us some uh, more some details in the in the document as well. One, I'm trying. I would I'd have to look and see how ours are in the database, but I do wonder one of the ways that some of our libraries do it is they're using a different permission group for people who are loaded in bulk. So you, if you are using a different permission group, then you could have the new barcode notice just run on cards created in that new permission group. I don't, I don't personally hate the idea of everybody getting an email when they get a new barcode because then they're going to need to use it for their e-resources. <laughs> so I, I think some of our libraries would appreciate that. Um, 
and um we we do use it um i pasted a copy of our template for our new user welcome notice in that at the end of that document um so we just use some if statements and just look at the um the what field is it uh the user.profile.id um uh, because that's what controls the permission group so we just had to figure out what permission group was tied to each user so we're just changing parts of the message to look different so for the students like we say something more like your school has signed you up for a free library card rather mm -hmm. than you know and talk more specifically about what's what resources they might be available to them do any but, of you have an age limit of uh, students you're allowed to email to? Yeah. I, I think in some states it's like, you know, uh, they have to be 13 or over in order to get an email. We, go ahead. Um, that is something we ran into. We did a really big library card drive with our middle school a few years ago. And um, Unfortunately, we didn't realize at the time that their student emails are blocked from any outside email. So you do have to be careful with that if you're relying on that as uh, your so primary <laughs> communication. Generated those thousands mm -hmm. of, of yeah. uh, new welcome card emails and they all bounced. Mm. They did. <laughs> that happened to us as well with one of our systems. Um, we leave it up to the school district to determine whether they send it, give us the email or not. If they give it to us, then it's in their account and we can email them. Um, so if they have restrictions, it's on their, their end to control that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think um, back to the action trigger thing for the new user. And I think um, I was, kind of coming around to what Gina was asking in the chat, and I don't know if this is ever an issue too. Sometimes those those patron loads result in updates to an existing patron record and not a creation of a record. So yeah, I don't know how, so you wouldn't get the new user welcome trigger. So that's a good question. <laughs> You could use the, if you were updating the barcode, you could do what the, the check folks are doing and send them a, a new barcode notice. True. But no, I don't think there is an account updated trigger, is there? No, um, not that I know of. I mean, the only thing I can think of is there's like an expiration notice, an expiration hook. And if you like carefully do your math and limit to your permission group for all these patrons where you're just setting them the same expiration date maybe some maybe that would work <laughs> feel i, I feel like it could be done <laughs> <laughs> i was looking for some possibility uh, connected to uh, expiration uh, updated, but I didn't find anything like that. Yeah, I know we there... send out expiration, pre-expiration notices. AU.expired is the hook. I think. Yeah. Yeah, we do that too. There is a hook for AU.renewed that could possibly be used in some way. Or there's there's is that AU renewed updated books too. or renewed people. It oh I didn't it doesn't say in the hook. I'm not sure. Oh so a sure. a user was renewed by having their expiration date changed is the description. So oh, okay. that, that could work. I was just looking at the form. There's also an AU updated. I don't know which what it all it looks what that looks at. I, I mean, think if, there, if everyone wants, I could just test it tomorrow and let people know. <laughs> I think it depends on the library policy because uh, we bulk uploaded uh, the new students, but uh, we want them to come to the library and activate their account in person. 
So that's the moment when we want to send them email. I would think that a using the AU updated would probably work for that then if you're changing something on the account when they come in. Maybe it's complicated because sometimes you updated something uh, what is not connected to new user. Yeah. And you to send a welcome email. So the barcode change is the, uh, is the best we found. Uh, and we, uh, the formulation is uh, very uh, universal, which means your uh, card has been updated. If, uh, if you didn't uh, do that, uh, please contact the library uh, and something like that. So, uh, uh, and then the sold information for new patients, like uh, where they can find the catalog and, uh, and things like that. There are, like to, at Tara Inn's example notice has all those if statements in there. So there are a bunch of ways to filter who like the making the notice different. So if you could find another variable, I don't, even if you can do it on StackCast, I don't know that you'd want to, because <laughs> that sounds messy, but either with, with permission groups or, um, one of the like we we do it a lot for library systems where individual members of the system want a slightly different email and so it's if if they're home library this location then they have hoopla and if they're not home library that location then they don't have hoopla so that's the way that that we use it but you might you might be able to to finesse it that way interesting so you're, you want them to get the email, not when you create the account from the bulk load, but when they stop by the library and actually physically receive a, phys a physical card. It would be cool to have a button in patron accounts that you could just push that said, send welcome message. Just saying. Yeah, I mean, we have the test email one, so that'd be kind of cool. That'd be cool, yeah. Things possible when you pay for it. <laughs> they are, and people agree with that. I see some wishlist launchpad <laughs> bugs coming our way. Yeah, I guess the only problem for me is like, um, I just the scoping to the library uh, level because um, our notifications are different per library. So, I mean... Sending an email test uh, with that button, I think, scopes to like a consortium notification for. Oh it. yeah, it would be yeah. just it would be a massive project because you yeah. would have to right. like have different administration components to it. But I'm just saying, in in the world where you don't have to pay for anything, test anything, or <laughs> figure anything out, having a button that you push that would send the correct welcome email to somebody would be amazing. Yeah. Well, I'm just a fox on a beach. Uh, what do I know? <laughs> but that does sound really nice. Something about beaches. I don't know, though. It looks like you're wearing long sleeves as a fox that is completely covered with fur on a beach. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we get cold or something. Maybe. Well, I do want to um, make sure that we're respectful of everyone's uh, afternoon slash evening here, depending on... Uh, or or very late morning, depending on what what time um, zone you're all in. Were there any things uh, that people had wanted to discuss that we did not touch on yet? If nothing else, I can can put a placeholder on the notes, and we can save them for our next meeting. I did have one other question. Um, we had a we had a former teacher on staff um, when, when we began discussing this. And she said that from experience, her biggest concern with something like this was when a student loses their credentials, their password or whatever, to actually use the account. And so um, I'm just curious. That's one of the reasons why actually using the student ID rather than issuing a new barcode is by far the more attractive option from my perspective. 
Um, but I'm just curious, just anecdotally, if this is a struggle that you guys have had or because you have those accounts in there and there's an email, do they usually have enough to be able to reset that pin and regain access? Or I'm seeing nods to that. So, so I'm assuming this isn't a huge problem for most people. Um, I just would be curious if it was or if anybody has any solutions. We're actually getting passwords from the school system. Well, but but that doesn't mean, okay, so, oh, so they they have yeah, a password. Yeah. Ah. Okay. And the school system was fine with that. And it, it makes it way easier I'm for the students. That, though, because they're still our patron. So that, I don't think that that would fly. I would have to think through that one a little more. I feel very uncomfortable with that. <laughs> um, interesting. I mean, it definitely sounds like an easier way around it, but uh, okay, I'll have to think about that one. There are libraries and library systems where they do use the last four of the barcode as the password. Uh, yeah, and so I would that... be okay with that as a starting point, but my, right. the expectation would be that you want to update that to make it more secure. And so I guess I, if we're really being considerate of their privacy as a patron, I don't think the teachers should necessarily have it. And, you know, I just, they would need to have an email or something so that they could reset that or have a way to do that. I'm yes. still working through how I feel about this, but I haven't, like, like there's an argument going on inside of my head. So I recently had to apply for a new library card at a new library. Um, I have the feels, but it doesn't, none of that matters um, because it's not evergreen, but it's okay. It's TLC, whatever. I'm not, Ruth, uh, I'm not interrupt you. I will hang out. I, I know some of us may have 3 p.m. commitments. So every if anybody needs to go, thank you so much for being here. And we will hang out and continue to discuss for anyone who's available. They use the eight digit date of birth um, for that. I know, but it is eight digits. And it is something that unless you're a close personal friend and you know what that ID number is, it is relatively ish secure but not by password standards it but whatever is. it's like it, i don't know how i feel about that. like I'm... i know <laughs> me either and then all of us then i had to log in i was like oh this is delightful and unless somebody like knows this number did it uh it doesn't matter so now with a student id if they're like spouting it off to the lunch lady to get their lunch very likely that somebody or if i mean if it's a four digit number yeah and the parents are all going to have yeah. birth dates. And so if that. we are following the Library Bill of Rights from ALA that users require, regardless of age, full stop, are I, entitled right. to privacy of library records. And I'm not, I'm just quoting the Library Users Bill of Rights. <laughs> um, then yeah. We, yeah. So that's... So does anyone here rely on the actual just reset mechanism if that... If that's the if they lose access, that's just what you're doing is you're expecting the student to reset it. Yes, that's exactly what we do. Okay. Um, granted, like I said, we are doing a small enough batch of students that we are physically processing them and giving them our actual physical library cards. So yeah. I understand that's not the case for everyone. Right. Um, but we do rely on them contacting us and saying, hey, I lost the card or I don't have access to my account anymore. And then we just do the same reset as we would for anyone. And that's how you would do it with any user that doesn't exactly. have an email address. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will say we thought pretty extensively about that privacy concern, especially because our normal is to send home the unfilled, the blank applications, have the guardians fill them out and then return them through the schools. Um, but at that point, the only information that the school is having um, is the um, address and contact information that they presumably already have. Um, and then um, the teacher may or may not have access to the physical card um, when the student gets that returned. But we've been very, very discreet if students already have an account um, and there are fines on it. We don't include that information. We just say contact us for more information about your account. And then um, if the guardian does that, then we'll go into that situation with them. But we do not say so-and-so has $150 in fines or anything like that. So we're very careful about what kind of information we include um, in anything that's going to be seen by somebody other than the student or their, their legal guardian. 
that's my preference is it would be something that the students can control as much as possible. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, Ian I had a question talking. about the recording. Um, were you going to link it um, in minutes or send it out? Or... Yeah. So I, I'm going to give it to Elizabeth. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, then Elizabeth will she will tell you it. if she's going to put it on so what typically these meetings go on like the reports interest group they record it goes on um the evergreen youtube channel um and so i don't like there's a like a section for each interest group i don't think this interest group has one yet so she may we may put it in google drive and give people the direct link um but Typically, that's how it would work is they would be uploaded to the um, appropriate playlists on the Evergreen YouTube channel. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is going to be um, a group that I'll be attending meetings for long term, but just early while I'm trying to learn Absolutely. how everybody's using things, um, I'm going to be hanging out. And I would say, you know, uh, any of these fine friends that are here with us today, as well as many more, are typically happy to be contacted directly if anybody, if you, there was anything in particular. Um, and, you know, feel free to send things to the listserv as well. Um, always, always good chatter. Um, awesome. So, yeah. Well, hey, thank you guys. I'm hopping out as well. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Bye.